All right. Happy Wednesday. It's uh, middle of the week. How about that? Where, uh, man, and the weather's good today. It was cool this morning in our place, 60-something degrees, which is cool for around here. Uh, on its way to 80-something, so we're good with that. <laughs> and uh, just looking forward to another great day. Hope you guys had a great night, good week, good sleep, all of those things. Uh, man, I've been busy in the evening uh, strategizing and writing out uh, ministry things that the Lord, I believe, is putting on us. And so uh, we've been we've been doing that, and I've been up early. It's my second morning to be up before two, uh, really just <laughs> writing down the things that the Lord uh, is downloading in my heart and spirit. And so I've been doing that. Uh, excited about it, and so that's where we are. And uh, man, I'm I'm ready to rock and roll today. <laughs> if you're ready, let's jump into some truth and uh, see what we can see. We're in Luke chapter five. Lord willing, we'll finish up chapter five tomorrow, and then we'll hit six on Monday. Uh, but but we are um, again just a quick <clears throat> review. Uh, uh, Luke is is determined to make sure that we understand that. Jesus has eyewitness accounts and proof that he is, in fact, the Messiah and uh, documented with witnesses and all of that. And then we're watching Jesus' life unfold where he's proving that he is Messiah because he has authority over Satan and those temptations that he threw at him. He has authority over the demonic realm, that which, which kind of wrecks havoc among this planet. Uh, he has authority over creation by causing the fish to jump into uh, the net. He has... Um, uh, authority over uh, sickness by healing um, uh, the, the leper and uh, bringing the paralytic. Uh, he has authority to forgive sins. Uh, and now we see where he has authority to hang out with sinners. And so uh, we're going to look at that, right? And so let's jump into the story. Uh, it says, uh, now this story is told in all of the other gospels except for John. Uh, but but Mark talks about it, Matthew talks about it, uh, and Luke talks about it. And so it says here, after he went out and looked at a tax collector uh, named Levi sitting in the tax office, he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began following him. Now, let's take just a minute and kind of unpack that, because there's a lot in that phrase that, that we should look at. Now, so Jesus was in a home. He healed the paralytic, right? Your sins are forgiven. And so four men carried the paralytic into the house. Five men began to walk home, right? Powerful thought, powerful scenario. So the teaching of the day is done in the house. Um, Matthew tells us that Jesus walked along the seashore. So he go, or uh, Mark does. He goes along the seashore. And he's teaching, and there's a crowd following. So he's teaching as he's going. So he's Capernaum is a seaport. So he walks out of a house, makes his way down to the sea. People from the house, I'm sure, are following him along with other people, and they're listening to him speak. And he gazes upon. That is that he, he it's an intense, it, it's one of those statements where he sees, right? Uh, it, it's a, it's a that he sees with an with an eye of, of gazing and intense look. And so who's he looking at? He's looking at a man named Levi. Now, Matthew calls himself Matthew, which means um, a favor of a uh, gift of Jehovah. But uh, Levi is his name. He is the son of Alphaeus, right? And so he's set up his booth. Uh, a tax collector, and he's stopping people uh, to demand that they that they pay. Now, if you've ever had one of those nuisances of like walking down one of the tourist towns, and there's somebody trying to sell you a timeshare or something else, and they just kind of get in your way, and they they tend to want to interrupt your day and and uh, and stop you, and then and then try to you know get money from you through whatever it is that they're offering. Uh, tax collectors could be seen something like that. They had their booth, and there's their they they could tax at whim. They could tax letters that you're carrying. Uh, they could tax uh, you know bags that you're carrying. They they could tax anything. They were a brutal lot. Uh, they were they were hated um, by by so many uh, because of of so many things, right? So they worked for Rome, and there's hatred because they worked for Rome. 
They are the, the evil empire from Israel's perspective. They want free from that. James and John, who were some of the disciples of Jesus, were called sons of thunder. They were the partners of, of, uh, of um, Peter and Andrew, and they were, they were zealots. That is, that they were into disruption. They were trying to disrupt Rome, whatever they could do. They wanted to overthrow it. They were trying to usher in the kingdom in that sense. And so uh, uh, Levi is on the complete opposite end of that. He's now sold out to Rome. And he said, I'm just going to suck it up. I'm going to be the outcast of, of Israel, and this is what I do. And so he gouges people for money. So he's got an idol. It's called money. Uh, he's gouging people. So there were certain taxes that Rome required. Anything over that that he could extract, steal, embezzle, whatever he did from others, they didn't want to know about, nor did they care. And so that's who he was. So he's harassing people. He's got soldiers there to stop people so he can have that conversation. Uh, he could detain people. He, so he had, he had Roman guards, Roman soldiers near this booth that he would just snap his fingers and they would go and harass whoever it was that they were going to harass. Now, in that role, he was barred from the synagogues. So he couldn't go and hear Jesus preach in the synagogues. He couldn't go into those places because he was unclean. He was, um, he was a liar. He was a thief, and he was he was worse than a Gentile. This is this is how, and we should know this. This is how he was seen by everybody around him. Now, in the scriptures, we don't really have a lot about Matthew. This is one of the most prominent, other than when he's named um, as as some of the apostles or disciple. But uh, he doesn't. He's not really. You know, James. Uh, and, and P, uh, John and Peter, they spoke. You can hear their their conversations. But uh, Thomas, he spoke, right? But Matthew, we, we have no record of him saying anything. That just sidebar. So um, Jesus looks at him, and he says this, follow me. Right now, that is the clarion call, right? If anyone wishes to come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. And so that is the call. Follow me, right? Now, something had to have been going on in Levi already. He had to have already known the scoundrel that he was, the sinful person that he was. Maybe he didn't know it always, but apparently something that he had heard in Jesus and something that he had seen potentially in some of the disciples in the Bruja that say, that uh, that Jesus had stirred up, uh, caught wind of him, but whatever was going on, God was already doing a work in Levi's heart because when he when Jesus looks at him and says, "Follow me," there was no who, who are you? What what's going on? Why why should I do that? He knew who Jesus was and he knew who he was and he knew he was a sinner and he was a tax collector and he knew that he was in a in a garbage. Uh, situation as far as the world was concerned, and he knew he didn't even like himself. He wanted free. He was one of those that that Jesus spoke of through Isaiah when he said, you are one who is uh, poor. You understand that you have all this wealth, but yet you're poor. You understand that you're a prisoner to your money and things like that. Uh, you, you know that that you are you are sick with sin, and you know that you were being oppressed, right? So he knew this, and he wanted this. is This is a salvation experience here. This, everything that he had begun to believe about himself, that look of Jesus, and him making making the statement, uh, "Follow me," was all it took. And Levi's all in because it says he closed up shop. He left everything. He's done with that. He's moving on. He's made his choice. He's counted the cost and says, all of this money that I've got and all of this potential earning here, I'm casting it away because I'm putting all my hope in Jesus. This, you don't miss that or you miss this story. That's what took place. And so Jesus is rescuing Levi, a man already at the threshold of this transformation in that sense. He knew he was he was one of those desperate. He knew his need. He didn't mind saying, man, I am a sinner. In every right, I am a sinner. And I am an outcast. And I am unworthy. And this is where he comes to. Now, let's look at the second part because this is amazing. 
and Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. I love this. I love what's taking place here. And this is the beauty of when you see new believers that come into your your church or however it is and you see them, they have they have friends who are who are still lost and still in the world. And so they're great opportunity for you to see the gospel uh, meted out in the world through that liaison between one who was had a foot in the world and now has his foot and feet deeply entrenched in the kingdom. He still has relationship. He still has currency in the world in that sense. And this is Matthew. So we used to call these Matthew parties. Back in the day, this is what we would do. And so at our church, uh, we we would have Sunday evening almost it for a season it felt like almost every Sunday evening we were just cooking out in our house it was kind of in the in the hill country and people would just make their way to our house on Sunday afternoons and we never knew who was going to show up there would be church folk that would show up those church folk would have brought their pagan friends and everybody else and so they would show up and there may have been some people who were had either some alcohol in the car or brought it in and it was in a sundry of people. And it was good because what it was was an opportunity for people who didn't know Jesus or Christ followers to be around Christ followers. And so it potentially could have been messy and everything else, but those were, we called them, now not to everybody else in-house, we called them Matthew parties. And so we loved having those. And this is what's going on here. Levi's going to have a big reception for who? For Jesus, right? Hey, man, I got my new friend, my best friend the one who has redeemed me, I want to introduce all my unsaved friends to him. And so, listen to who was at the party. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors, because those are business associates. Those are, those are this, they're in the same ilk, the same level of, of uh, grossness and vileness in the community. So, there's honor among thieves, so to speak. So, all these tax collectors are there. And, um, uh, and apparently there's a bunch of sinners there as well. Besides tax collectors, there's just the dredges of society from a worldly perspective in this place and from a religious, uh, hypocritical perspective. And so there's all these unsavory people at this house. And Jesus is in there, and he's reclining at the same table they are, and he's eating with them. You get the picture? Uh, the, the, the rabbi, the one that's creating a lot of stir in all of the synagogues, the Pharisees kind of, kind of following them around, trying to, trying to make a citizen's arrest, trying to find something wrong with him, something he's done wrong so they can trap him, has followed him to Levi's house. And so they're not going in because they're holy people. They're not going to associate with those. And so they just see him going into Levi's house, and they know that's the house of the tax collector, and they hate him, and they don't know why Jesus doesn't hate him <coughs> and why his disciples don't. And so this conversation is uh, to the disciples. So get the picture. He's finished. There, there's just been a man that couldn't walk, walk into a house and walked out of the house, and the Pharisees were probably on the outside of that looking in. They follow him as he makes his way down to the seaside, and people are listening to him as he's teaching, much like rabbis would do. And then they see him look at Levi and say, follow me. And then they understood that there was going to be a reception, and, and Levi, whether that was the same day, the next day, the next week, whatever was going on, this is how the story unfolds for us. And so he's throwing a party. And in this party, the Pharisees are kind of stalking the neighborhood and looking inside the house and who's coming and who's going. And they're just the, they're just the religious police. They love to find people doing wrong because they love to be right in what they do. And so uh, they, see, they see sinners going in there. They see tax collectors going in there. I'm assuming they see Peter and James and John and Andrew, Bartholomew, Nathaniel into Levi's house, Jesus in there. Right, and so they're hanging out. They're having a party. They're eating food. They're just enjoying life. And here's what the Pharisees are doing in verse thirty: the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling to his disciples, saying, "Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Why are you doing that? What what is going on? What possible good could be happening from you guys doing that?" 
<clears throat> and so they're grumbling and complaining. They're trashing Jesus for associating with the collectors and the sinners. Le listen, Levi was one, he was he was the repenting, right? He was one of the poor. He was one of the prisoners. He was one of the blind. He was one of the oppressed, right, that Jesus spoke of from the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> but yet he had left everything, and he's all in. And he's simply now being transformed and moving from one environment to another, right? And so his eyes have been opened. He's been in the realm of darkness. He's now becoming into the realm of light, and he's beginning to follow Jesus, and he will eventually be appointed as one of the apostles, and he will eventually be martyred for his faith. This is a man who is in transition and transformation. And so uh, <clears throat> Jesus' response to these people, now listen, they're not talking to Jesus. They're grumbling, these rabbis and scribes, scribes the ones who would write out the law, <clears throat> and so they're just a bunch of holy people. And and some Pharisees may have been well-meaning. Nicodemus was one of those, and there, there were some others. Um, but, but for the most part, they were just these religious hypocrites. And so they're grumbling and complaining and either disciples who are coming and going, they're just, they're just saying, Hey, come here, let me talk to you. And then they're just chewing on them about and trashing Jesus. And then it says this, uh, and Jesus answered them, right? So they're, they're harassing the disciples. <laughs> Jesus steps up and answers. And he says this, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Now, in case you missed it, that's a statement of condescension. He came for all, but there are those people, like the Pharisees, who think they're not sick, who don't think that there's something wrong with them. They don't think they need to repent. They think that they are righteous. In spite of John calling many people out for the baptism of repentance, these guys didn't feel the need to. They stood there and watched others, but they had no no need to, to do that. And so these are cold-hearted, calloused, religious folk. And they're chastising Jesus because he's sitting and eating with sinners and tax collectors. And so he says, listen, I came to those who were sick. Well, everybody's sick, but what's he saying? The Pharisees don't believe they are. I got nothing for you, he says. I got nothing. Who did he come for? Those who, who were aware of their poverty, right? The poor, the blind, the ne those who knew there was more, those who, those who felt imprisoned by their sin, those who knew that they, had, they were spiritually bankrupt, they had nothing good to offer. This is Levi. Levi knew, I got, I got money, but that's not, that's not kingdom currency. I got nothing to bring. I'm in bondage to this. I'm in bondage to, to my sin. I don't like who I am. I feel oppressed. I feel like I'm getting it from all sides. That's who Jesus came for. Jesus came for the people. That's why he says, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, right? But blessed are these who know who they are and their, their lot in life. That know there is a deficiency and they need help. That's who he came for. Now, the, the church folk in the deconstruction movement and the progressive movement love to say that this is, this is all Jesus was about, was just loving sinners. And so you and I should shut up and quit calling out people who are living in sin and just love them. How dare us be unloving people? But here's what I would tell you. Jesus certainly hung out with sinners and tax collectors. But he never condoned what they did. He called them to something. And so we in the church are, should be among those like that, right? We should be out in the world with those who have um, uh, uh, mental dysphoria with, with gender and things like that. And the, the, the uh, sexual perversions and just your sinners and, and liars and thieves. And we, we should be out there. Not cozying up to them and condoning what they're doing, but just living among them so that they might see the light, the life, and the love that God has given to us to share with them and to call them to a better way of life. That's the gospel. That's what's going on here. Nothing short of that. God is never meant for us to condone what the world does, but to call the world up to this great 
place that God has called all of us to, that to repentance and forgiveness of sins. That's why he told the woman who was sitting at the well, he didn't mince words with her. Yeah, you've, you're right. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not even your own, right? He, he, he didn't go, hey, and that's cool. He just said, hey, this is who you are. To the woman caught in adultery, he said, hey, there's no one condemn you. I'm not condemning you. I'm just telling you to stop sinning. That's all God cares about. God's not interested in beating the world up. He just wants their sin gone and covered, repented for. That's the message that we find in this in this uh, story today. Man, Lord bless you guys. Can't wait to see more and share more with you in the morning.